Welcome to this presentation from Pawpaw TV. We present an original lecture from Dr. Jerry McLaughlin, Professor Emeritus of Pharmacognosy at Purdue University and winner of the Tyler Prize. He is talking about his life's work. It is presented in nine parts. Since he is talking about a serious condition, we remind you that his remarks cannot be taken as medical advice, but are intended for educational purposes only. If you are viewing this from a country that does not allow this kind of teaching, please stop viewing now. And if you are sick, see a doctor. Maybe you can find one that speaks herbal medicine. Okay, I was at Purdue uh, as a professor for 28 years. I served 34 years in total as a professor, and I retired in 1999. And at Purdue, I did uh, several things that, I, that I'm very pleased with. Uh, I developed a couple biological assays that you used to detect any cancer activity. And you don't have to spend a lot of money to use these assays. One of them is using sea monkeys. These are called brine shrimp. And they, you can grow these and hatch them from the eggs and grow them in salt water. And you can kill them and nobody cares. <laughs> They're not protected by Senator Dole's law in 1984, which gave animals rights and welfare. That law set cancer research back at least 20 years. We were using about a half a million mice a year in an anti-leukemic scheme. And suddenly, the National Cancer Institute, in order to get a better appropriation, said we won't use animals to do cancer research. Boy, was that dumb. But that's what they did. So I developed an assay using brine shrimp. Brine shrimp are very sensitive to things that in, their, in their water that they're swimming in. And all anti-cancer agents kill brine shrimp. So I said, hey, I'll just kill brine shrimp and look for things that might be anti-cancer in plants. Second thing I did is to get a little more specific. I grew tumors on potatoes. Plants get tumors. And I called this the potato disc assay. And I could inhibit the growth of tumors on potatoes with anti-cancer agents. And so I could use that then as a secondary screen to follow up my brine, my brine shrimp positives. And then I would go to Purdue's cell culture lab where they had six tumor cell lines from human tumors growing. And I could have my active Zen screened in that assay, and that cost $120. And boy, that will burn up your, your research funds real fast. So I could do my biological assays with real cheap biological assays without having to go to cell culture and burn up my money. I could spend my money on the chemistry of my plants instead of on the biologist. Okay. So that was my approach. I had actually support from the National Cancer Institute for 24 years. And the work that I'm going to talk about tonight was supported by $5 million of your money. Five million bucks. Now, that's not really quite true because the university has what they call indirect costs. And the administrators take a third of your money away from you so that you don't have that to spend. And at Purdue, our president needed a jet airplane. <laughs> now, during this time, then, I was able to secure 4,000 species of plants. Now, this is a lot of plants. In all of the United States, there are only 6,000 species of plants growing. So I had 4,000 species of plants that I personally had my hands on, and, screen and I, I got through the screening of 3,500. So I had 500 left that I couldn't get through, and I gave those to the National Cancer Institute, so they're screening them now, so that that's being done. Okay? And out of those 3,500 species of plants, I had plants from Central America, South America, Mexico, North America, Africa, Asia, Australia, you name it. I went through all those plants, one by one, and guess what the best one was? Pawpaw growing two miles from my office. Okay, So there it is, growing in your backyard, the best thing that I ran into for cancer. Now there are some relatives of pawpaw that are tropical that are, that are equally potent, but by gosh, this one was right there, and we have plenty of it to work on. And incidentally, if you try to work on plants from somebody else's country today, you're accused of being a biopirate because you're stealing their resource, okay? And so this has really put 
the crimp on doing research on plants from the tropics or from other parts of the world because all the politicians want to be involved and you have to have you have to have contracts signed on who's going to get the benefit if anything is found and by the time you get all this stuff done you know you spend so much time just doing that that you don't have any time to do any research you know it's so stupid how greedy people can get uh, in all these plants in, I, I isolated about 350 new compounds that were significantly cytotoxic in our produced cell culture lines. And these were new compounds. So that's a lot of work. So this is what I'm good at. I can do grind and find research. I can grind up a plant and find what's in there and, and tell you if it's biologically active, okay? Uh, and the anonaceous acetogenins then are the most important leads. And these are the type of compounds I found in pawpaw because the plant family there is called the anonaceae. And so these are called the anonaceous acetogenins. Aceto referring to acetate, that's like vinegar. And so these are compounds that are put together with two carbon units of acetate into long chain fatty acids. The next slide. So this shows us a picture of pawpaws, a little cluster of them called the Indiana banana. And when I was about four years old, my dad gave me some of these and said, Jerry, you can eat these. These are Indiana bananas. And I was hungry for bananas because in World War II, you couldn't get bananas. And I ate a whole bunch of them and I threw up. And I threw up and I never forgot this and I had it in for this plant for a long, long time. You know, I knew there was something in there. Because if you throw up from eating something, you know there's something biologically active there. Uh, <clears throat> the fruits of them taste sort of like banana custard and a good friend of mine, Neil Peterson, has grown 1,800 trees in his lifetime and, and sampled the fruits from every tree. He's picked out the three best trees for the best tasting fruit and he just recently, in the last month, got a patent awarded for those trees. So he's got the three best, so he'll, he's got like the red delicious variety of pawpaw. Okay, so, uh, and these will be commercially available someday. You, you wait and see. And he's got Snapple beverages and, you know, ocean spray, cranberry juice, and everybody wanting to, uh, to make pawpaw drinks and things. Scientific names are Simna triloba, and interestingly, a fluid extract of the seeds was sold by Eli Lilly Company as an emetic back in 1898. An emetic is something that makes you vomit. That's back when the physicians would make you vomit and they would bleed you and they would purge you to get you well. And as you vomit, the next time you vomit, remember that you sweat just before you vomit. That's called the diaphoria, the sweating. And as you sweat, you're sweating the toxins out of your body. And that's what they believed would help to make you get better. And probably does. The next slide. This is the distribution area of pawpaw all over the East United States. So this is not a rare tree. And I've got assays or uh, population studies from the U.S. Department of Agriculture on how many pawpaw trees there are out there. And there's millions. Indiana has 18 million trees, for example, wild pawpaw trees growing. And they've got a few more because I've got about 2,000 of them planted on my farm in, in Indiana. So uh, hopefully they're going to grow up and I'll make some money from selling the biomass there. And incidentally, we've created a new crop with this. And people at Kentucky State University have gotten grants about $170,000 a year to study the growth of pawpaw as a new crop to replace tobacco. Now, wouldn't it be neat to have a plant that replaces a carcinogenic plant? So, the next slide. But this is in the Ananasi family then. There are about 120 genera in this family, about 2,100 species. Almost all of them are tropical or subtropical. So pawpaw is the only one that's temperate that grows where it loses its leaves. And so it's probably been carried northward by the Native Americans over the period of you know, centuries so that it's up here now in the deciduous area. But all the rest of them are small trees and shrubs that are in the tropics. Copyright 2008 Richard Lund. All rights reserved.